A lot of you probably already know the name Desmond Doss, and even more of you would remember it if I reminded you that he was a conscientious objector in World War II that refused to carry a weapon into combat, despite that he saved 75 men at Hacksaw Ridge as a medic. But what almost none of you have heard of is the experimental unit that he was a part of. Today we're talking about the 77th Infantry Division, aka the Old Bastards. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you realize it or not, we've all been exposed to the concept that you should never underestimate the old guy because sometimes he just might be a complete badass. We see it everywhere. There's memes and commonly held sayings all over the internet like youth and exuberance is no match for old age and treachery or beware an old man in a profession where young men die. And if that wasn't enough, in pop culture and TV, there are characters in pretty much every show and every movie that are the embodiment of this sentiment and they are more often than not the fan favorite that everybody loves. On Nickelodeon, a kid's channel, you see characters like Uncle Iroh and King Boomy. In anime, you see characters like Master Roshi. In more adult adult shows, you've got characters like Mike from Breaking Bad, Lloyd from Yellowstone, and Sir Barristan from Game of Thrones. Characters like this are everywhere in pop culture and they are catered to every age group because it is never too early to learn the simple concept of be careful because that old man just might whoop your fucking ass. And I bring all this up because it raises one simple question. If old men really are such badasses and experience is truly such a valuable asset, what would happen if you made an entire army out of old guys? Well, we don't have to wonder because in World War II, America did just that and the results speak for themselves and we're gonna get into it right after a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Henson's Shaving. Okay, here's the deal. Henson's is a family owned machine shop that makes parts for the aerospace industry. There's literally parts on the Mars Rover that these guys made and one day they woke up and they're like, hey, we're just gonna make the most precise safety razor on the market. And this is it, this is all they sell. It comes in aluminum or titanium. If you wanna pay extra, it comes with a little stand and then they also sell the razor blades so you have a one stop shop not because their razor blades are proprietary because this thing will take any shaving razor blade on the market you don't have to buy their proprietary cartridge you don't have to sign up for their monthly delivery thing no you buy this one time and then you can put any five cent razor in it and shave for the rest of your life so the product itself is fantastic but more importantly the company is awesome because every time a youtuber does an ad like this they get sent a little media packet full of talking points what to say what not to say and so on now i'm not supposed to disclose this but the brief that i got for henson's basically said there is no script do whatever you want, we trust you. Also, in the first paragraph, they said this, quote, if for whatever reason you don't get a good shave with our product, please let us know. If we can't help you, then don't endorse us. We think we've made one of the very best razors in the world. If you disagree, we'd rather not ask you for a non-genuine endorsement. So the razor's great, and this is the type of company that you actually want to give your money to. I'm going to have a link for them down below. Let's get back to the video. Okay, here's the deal. I've been making pro-American history videos on the internet for about two years now, and without fail, every single time I make a video about America and World War II, I get this exact keyboard warrior in the comment section. Buh! America didn't win World War II. They showed up late and tried to take credit for it. Buh! Okay, look, on one hand, I want to give this a serious answer. There's no American that's saying America won World War II all by themselves. Nobody is saying that. It was a huge team effort by the big three, America, the UK, and the USSR, as well as a bunch of other countries that were occupied or close to being occupied, they all made humongous sacrifices to win World War II. It was a massive team effort. So when an American says America won World War II, they're simply saying the Allied forces won, America is part of the Allied forces, therefore America won. It is a factually correct statement, just like it would also be a factually correct statement to say that the USSR and the UK also won World War II. On the other hand, if we're talking shit, I can do that too, because guess what? When it comes to World Wars, America's the MVP. I hate to break it to you, but let's just face facts here. If World War III breaks out tomorrow and we're picking teams by lining all the countries up on the wall like it's dodgeball in gym class, guess who's getting picked first? America. If you disagree with that, it's because you're being disingenuous or you're fucking dumb. And the whole America showed up late to World War II thing, look, number one seed in the tournament gets a bye. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Furthermore, it's not like World War II was on the verge of ending and America popped in at the last second so they could be on the winning team, okay? World War II ended because America came off the fucking top rope with aircraft carriers, Sherman tanks, and a atomic bombs. Sorry, I'm getting horribly sidetracked. I apologize. The point I'm trying to get to is that there's a lot of people on the internet that like to say America showed up late to World War II, but the fact of the matter is it's not like America had a choice. That was literally the 
only option because in 1939 when World War II kicked off, America didn't really have a military to go fight with. Okay, let me break this down for you. 16 million Americans served in the military in World War II and at its peak, the US military had 12 million people actively serving in it. In 1939 when World War II started, America's military had 200,000 people in the army and 100,000 people in the navy. To put that into perspective, America had the 19th largest military on the planet and 18th was Portugal, which is approximately the size of Indiana, which is one of America's 50 states. And if that wasn't bad enough, not only was the American military small, it also just wasn't very good at this point in time either. They were so underfunded that the American military only had 329 light tanks that were outdated and 1,800 aircraft that were also outdated. And if that wasn't bad enough, not only did they not have good equipment and there wasn't very many of them, they didn't really know how to fight either because America hadn't revisited its battle doctrine since World War One, meaning the only fight that America knew how to participate in was trench warfare, which was not what World War II was. So if America wants to have a meaningful impact in World War II, they're going to have to rebuild an entire military from the ground up, both physically and conceptually. So the American government and the American military got to work on this right away in 1939 because they knew America was going to have to participate in this war whether the public wanted to or not and hint the american public wanted absolutely nothing to do with world war ii from 1939 through 1941. at this point in time the american public very much viewed world war ii as a european conflict that america had no business getting involved with and they wanted nothing to do with it despite that the united states government started to institute a draft in october of 1940 forcing young men into the military to grow its military size just in case. Fast forward about a year, December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, committing the cardinal sin of fucking with America's boats, essentially flipping the American public sentiment of we don't want to be involved to cowabunga it is. In less than 24 hours on December 8th, 1941, the American government, Congress, has officially declared war on Japan. Three days after that, December 11th, Hitler declares war on America, at which point all of America is pretty much like, I mean, you didn't touch the boats, but fuck it, you can get some too. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. In the days and weeks and months following the attack on Pearl Harbor, not only have hundreds of thousands of young men volunteered to join the United States military, but the draft would ramp up as well. The army was growing so much so fast that they were activating and standing up new divisions left and right, one after another. And by March of 1942, these new divisions that were being stood up were almost entirely comprised of draftees. They had some officers and some NCOs that were assigned to stand up the entire division. But aside from that, all of the new guys that were coming in were all untrained new recruits that were drafted. And one of these first all drafty divisions was the 77th Infantry Division. Now, I need you to understand how absolutely crazy this situation is. Standing up a new division is a humongous undertaking, okay? A military unit of that size, that's like 15,000 men. That is a living, breathing entity, okay? There's history, there's standard operating procedures, there's leadership, there's a way of doing things, and that way has probably been written in blood for years by the men that came before you and you're just popping one up overnight. Okay, that's fucking crazy. Okay, let me explain this in a hypothetical so hopefully you can understand a little bit better, okay? Imagine that you showed up to work tomorrow. Let's say that you, you worked on an assembly line for Ford and you're building F-150s and you showed up to work and they gave you and a couple of your buddies that you work with keys and they're like, hey, drive across town. There's a big ass empty building. I need you to go ahead and start another manufacturing plant. There's no machines. Figure out the machines you need, figure out what order they need to go in, figure out the new fucking car that you're gonna build and figure out all of this shit, how you're gonna pay everybody, taxes, everything. Figure all of it out. By the way, the new workforce is coming in next week. None of them are fucking trained. You have to go ahead and train them on all the shit that you haven't even figured out yourself yet. Good luck. And if that wasn't hard enough, the 77th Infantry Division was a guinea pig division. It was literally an experiment. You see, the high-ranking military and the government were concerned, and they didn't know what it was going to take to win World War II, and they didn't know if they had enough young men, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. What if all of those young men got taken out, and we needed to rely on the older generation of men? to go fight this war. They needed to know what these older men in their 30s and 40s and 50s would be capable of physically doing on the battlefield, and they needed to get that data now so they had it in the future should they need it. So when they comprised the 77th Infantry Division, they basically gave them all of the old guys. Okay, the average age of a draftee in 1942 was 23 years old. The average age of somebody in the 77th ID 
was 33 years old. And bear in mind, that's the average. The oldest new recruit I could find in the 77th Infantry Division was 53 years old, and he was a World War I veteran. And some of you are probably like, yeah, 53 is pretty old, but 33 isn't that old at all. Why are you making a big deal about this? Okay, look, as far as joining the military at the age of 33, that's ancient. That's almost unheard of. I mean, think about it. You can join the military at 17 years old, be done, and have 20 years in service with a full pension at 37, 38 years old, and these guys are joining at 33. I mean, when I went through basic and AIT, the oldest guy we had was my buddy Flores. He was 28 years old and everybody called him Gray Bush the Wise. So the point I'm trying to get across to you is like, yeah, it's really weird to join the military that late in life, but also it's a good kind of weird because every person that's been in the military ever, if you came up to them and asked them, hey, if you had to go off to war and you could either go with a platoon of 18 year old kids or a platoon of 30 year old men, everybody's picking the 30 year old men 100% of the time. Because you got to realize when these 18, 19, 20, year old new recruits are coming in for training half the battle is having the army the drill instructors come in and teach these kids all the life lessons that mommy and daddy never got around to while they were growing up as kids they don't have to do that with a bunch of 30 year old men these guys have been out in the real world for 15 years getting their asses whooped by life and eating shit sandwiches they're already with the program so the 77th ID shows up to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. That's 16 weeks and then another 12 weeks for their advanced training, which for most of them is just going to be infantry. And they absolutely crush it. They show up and there's very little like disciplinary or life lessons being handed out by the drill sergeants because, well, they're older than most of the drill sergeants. It's literally a bunch of middle-aged men showing up being like, okay, I'm here. Show me what I got to do to not die. And then whenever somebody was being an asshole, they would police themselves. Like one of the new recruits is being a dick. All the other new recruits would handle that issue internally before it even got to the drill sergeants because they wanted everybody squared away. So fast forward two months, they are on week eight out of the 16 for basic training and they are head and shoulders above all the other new training divisions. They are the best division they have. Have. They are so good that when Winston Churchill came over from England halfway through their basic training, they were the unit that was selected to do a parade for Winston Churchill to show off how badass the American army was going to be. And here's what Winston Churchill had to say about it. Quote, the faces of the men gave me the greatest and everlasting memory of the day. I have never been more impressed than I was with the bearing of the men whom I saw. The undemonstrative, therefore grim determination of the newly drafted bodies bodes ill for our enemies. So this experimental guinea pig unit of old guys is absolutely crushing it. They go on, they finish basic training. I don't have the exact stats, but it is documented that a disproportionately high amount of all of the 77th infantry qualified as expert with the M1 Grand right out of basic training. From there, they go and they do their 12 weeks of advanced training and they do a great job at that too. At this point, upper military is kind of looking at these guys like, okay, well, this is, this is actually kind of working. Let's see what these old guys can really do. So they send them down to Louisiana for eight weeks and they're going to do a war game the 77th id going up against another new division that just got stood up full of 23 year olds literally the old guys versus the new guys youth and exuberance versus old age and treachery we're going to have a legit war game and see who outperforms the other and when i tell you the 77th id whooped that other division's fucking ass it is a complete understatement oh my god i almost died no so okay, now at this point, it's winter in Louisiana. It's going to be cold at night, especially considering they're not allowed to have tents and they're not allowed to have fires. They're just out there sleeping on the ground for two months doing this war game, going force against force. So naturally, the 77th ID wants to play the mental warfare game and ruin it right out of the gate for these young kids. So bearing in mind that it's winter and everybody's going to be cold at night, the 77th launches a bunch of very aggressive ambush attacks, basically pinning the other force between them and and a river and they just keep advancing closer and closer until the other division is forced to cross the river on foot getting all of their shit completely soaked. Okay, and some of you are probably like, oh, they got a little bit wet. Who cares? Trust me. If you were living outside for two months and every possession that you owned to your name was on your back in a backpack and you weren't allowed to have a tent or fire to dry your clothes and all your shit just got soaked, you would care. Okay, there's nothing worse than walking around for 16 hours holding a gun with a heavy backpack on and the only comfort you get at the end of the day is some dehydrated food and the opportunity to change out your wet socks for more wet socks. Okay, whether you believe me or not, I just need 
need you to trust me. It's going to take a mental toll on some 18, 19, 20 year old kids. Believe me. And from there, it only gets like a thousand times worse. I keep reiterating this, but you got to remember these are middle-aged men. Okay. These are dudes that are working construction jobs in the 1940s before OSHA was around walking around on I beams with no harnesses, eating lunch, and nobody gives a shit. You got dudes that were working in offices before they had an HR department. Okay. These guys are bringing so much workplace pranks and tomfoolery to the table. These 20 year olds aren't going to know what hit them. So one of the big things the 77th does is they start pretending to be in this other division at night. Like they'll roll up at night. There's like one guy left awake, you know, pulling guard duty, whatever. They'll roll up to him and be like, Hey, uh, commander, so-and-so, whatever the fuck said, I need to take this Jeep and go take it over to HQ, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, whatever, man. He like nods back off of sleep while he's supposed to be on guard. 77th ID guy just steals their Jeep. I mean, strategically transfers it to a different location. Like they're stealing all their vehicles. They're stealing all their equipment. And then, you know, usually when you're doing military stuff, you want to sever enemies communications so they can't communicate at all. Not the 77th ID. No, we've got fucking Jimmy who worked for the phone company for 10 years. We're going to find the enemy communication lines. We're going to tap into them. And then we're just going to start feeding them bad intel to make complete fucking chaos behind enemy lines. And then all the boys are going to gather around the radio at night and we're all going to listen to the higher ups in their chain of command complain about how poorly they're performing. <laughs> At the conclusion of this war game, the 77th ID has just completely outclassed this other division full of young men, and it really starts raising some eyebrows because now people really want to know what these old guys are physically capable of doing. And this is where it goes from being kind of fun to not fun at all for the 77th ID because the real experiments are about to begin. They send the entire 77th to a place called Camp Hyder. It's about 100 miles outside of Phoenix, Arizona in the middle of the desert. So they show up to Camp Hyder. It's literally just the desert with a couple of tents, not even enough tents for the entire division. They have to go and dig their own wells to find their own water. And then because they didn't have enough tents, they're out there literally building mud huts to live in. So after they get done literally building an army base from from scratch, the army comes along and they're like, hey, we want to know how far a normal dude can march in the desert in 100 degree heat if we only give him one quart of water. So here's what you guys are going to do. We're going to force you to march and you're just going to keep marching until a certain number of you pass out. That way we'll have a really good idea of how far a single dude can go on one quart of water. So this is already borderline cruel and unusual punishment, but it doesn't stop there because after they figure out how far a guy can go on a single quart of water, they decide that they're going to start having six day exercises where they have the second lieutenant, the lowest ranking officer that presumably knows the least, guide a platoon of men through the desert for six days straight. And if they want to be able to get their next day's supply of water and food, they have to be in the right place at the right time at the end of the day. Otherwise, they just don't get the food and water. You thirsty, Stanley? Okay, they're literally doing some Hunger Games shit with their own troops. And for those of you that don't know, it's literally a running joke in the military that lieutenants suck at land navigation and always get lost. There's literally men that die from exposure and dehydration during this period at Camp Hyder from the 77th Infantry Division. And this goes on for six months that the 77th is out in the middle of the desert having experiments run on them. And after that six month period came to an end and they got orders saying they were going to move on to some other type of training they decided that in true military fashion, they were going to put this behind them by utilizing a dark sense of humor. The joke was that their time in the desert was just as shitty as actually going to war. So they came up with their own medal, the Hyder campaign medal to commemorate their time in the desert that they would all wear on their uniforms as a joke. The ribbon of the medal was made out of a piece of sandpaper and the medal itself was a broken thermometer. And to absolutely nobody's surprise, the war department decided that they were not going to officially recognize the Hyder campaign medal. Regardless, the entire unit is now being shipped back over to Pennsylvania where they are going to have one month of advanced rifle marksmanship training, despite the fact that most of them already qualified as expert. So they go, they do that. They get even better at shooting than they already were. And then after that, the army comes out and they're like, Hey, I've got this new sub zero temperature sleeping bag that I want to have tested. So we're going to take you guys, our Guinea pig division. We're going to send you over to West Virginia. Have you go up in the mountains with this new sleeping bag, no tents, no fires. I just want you to live there for a month, hang out, freezing your ass off and just sleep in these sleeping bags at night. And if you guys survive, we'll know they work. Okay, good. See you in a month. Should I keep going? Why are you the way that you are? So they go, they do that. They freeze their balls off for a month. They climb back down from the mountain and the army's like, Hey, guess what? It's uh, early 1944. We've decided that we don't need you guys for D-Day. You're not going to be going over to the European theater. We're actually going to send you over to the Pacific to help out the Marine Corps. So next step of your training, you're going to head over to Virginia and you guys are going to train for a month doing amphibious landings in winter in the Atlantic ocean. But good news, 
you're already cold, so have fun. So they go, they do that, they crush it just like everything else they do. Now they're headed off to Hawaii where they're going to go through jungle warfare training for six weeks. Now this is probably the most important training the 77th is going to get considering that they're going into war in the Pacific theater up against the Japanese in a jungle environment and the Japanese are presumably already masters of their own environment. And pretty much everybody in the 77th is hyper aware of this and it makes them take this chunk of training that much more serious. And one of the things that they notice is when they show up to jungle warfare school, there's the archway that they walk through. It says jungle warfare school and it's got the tagline below it in quotes it says if they don't stink stick them which is obviously referring to what you're supposed to do with your bayonet if you come across an enemy's corpse that isn't decomposing because at this point in time it was highly likely that that person wasn't actually dead and they were pretending to be dead or hurt so that they could ambush you and i believe that's one of the big lessons that the 77th took to heart from this period of training for reasons that we're gonna find out in a little bit so they finish Jungle Warfare School and that's it. They're going off to war in the Pacific Theater after over two years of training in multiple different climates, in multiple different terrains all over the United States, spanning over the course of two years. This unit that is now on average 35 years old is headed to war. So July 1944, they show up and they're going to be helping the Marine Corps with the Mariana Islands campaign. This is a Marine Corps operation. They are running the show and the man in charge is the Marine Corps General Holland Howling Mad Smith. And he has not not been very impressed with the army's performance so far helping him with the first island in the Mariana Islands campaign, Saipan. During the Battle of Saipan, General Smith was so unimpressed with the 27th ID's performance that he actually had their general relieved of command and had a Marine Corps general placed in charge of an army division. So General Smith is already not thinking very highly of the army's capabilities and when he finds out that he is being reinforced with the 77th ID, a guinea pig unit that is comprised mostly of middle-aged men, he's not very happy about it. So they're getting ready to invade Guam and General Smith's plan is to not send in the 77th Infantry Division as a singular fighting unit. He's going to split them up and basically use them for reinforcements. Like if this unit over there lost a platoon, he's just going to take a platoon from the 77th, give it to those guys over there, and he's basically going to disband and piecemeal out the entire division is his plan. And that's exactly what happens. For the amphibious landing on Guam, they take some of the 77th ID platoons, they give them out to some of the Marine Corps units, some of the other army divisions, and they send them into battle. A couple days later, General Smith Smith, wondering how the old guys are doing, writes out to his commanders like, hey, how are these old guys performing? Can we use more of them? What's the deal? And to General Smith's surprise, according to all of his leaders in the field, these old dudes can throw down. They're absolutely awesome. A Marine battalion commander even went so far as to say, and I quote, there is no doubt in our minds that the 77th were good people to have alongside in a fight. As a result, we started referring to them as the 77th Marine Division. Okay, full stop. I need you guys to really appreciate what just got said here, okay? The Marine Corps or I love them, but they're not good at a whole lot. Really, if I were the commander in chief, I wouldn't call up the Marine Corps unless I wanted something dead, broken, or pregnant. That's really where they shine. That's their wheelhouse. You want to know what the Marines aren't good at? Giving compliments to other people. They're just, they're not about it, okay? So for the Marine Corps to look over at the 77th ID guys, a bunch of middle-aged army dudes killing people in battle and go, you're one of us. That's the best compliment the Marines know how to give, okay? It's a, it's a huge deal. This is the equivalent of the Jedi Council giving you a seat on the Council and giving you the rank of Master. This is unprecedented. Allow this appointment lightly. The Council does not. You're on this Council. We do. grant you the rank of Master. What? Take a seat, Master Skywalker. What? So when General Howling Mad Smith reads this, he's like, damn, okay, well, if one of my battalion commanders thinks that these are Marines, I'm going to treat them like Marines. I'm not piecing out the 77th Infantry Division one platoon at a time anymore. I'm going to send in the entire division on the Marines right flank. So pretty much immediately the entire 77th Infantry Division is sent in and they make an amphibious landing on the beach on the Marines right flank. 15,000 middle-aged men from the East Coast rolling up in amphibious tractors getting out with M1 Grands and Tommy guns ready to fuck shit up. This is the metaphorical equivalent of dad getting home from work. The Japanese just don't know it yet. And this amphibious landing their movement up the beach and into battle was absolutely textbook. It was the epitome of slow is smooth and smooth is fast. It was the least chaotic amphibious landing anybody had ever seen. And as all this is going on, the Navy and some seagoing Marines are watching this amphibious landing take place and a seagoing Marine famously says, would you look at those old bastards go, officially christening them with their new nickname, 
the old bastards. Now, the Battle of Guam rages on for about two more weeks until the island is secured on August 10th, 1944, and at the conclusion of this battle, it becomes clear to absolutely everyone, including General Howling Mad Smith, that his battalion commander was correct about the 77th Infantry Division. Because over the past two weeks of the Battle of Guam, the old bastards have racked up 2,741 confirmed kills and sustained only 248 in return. Okay, that is a ratio of 11 to 1 one going up against an enemy that has home field advantage and the luxury of playing defense from fortified machine gun positions which is absolutely insane and with a performance like that their new monikers of the old bastards and the 77th marines are pretty much set in stone with even general holland howling mad smith himself referring to them as such because of their incredible performance at Guam, they are then given some rest and relaxation in New Caledonia, so they hop in the boats and head there immediately. They get about halfway there, and then the big green weenie strikes. Change of plans, no more R&R. We're going to turn the boats around and head straight over to the Philippines, because in Leyte, MacArthur has four divisions, and they are completely stalled out, and they need the old bastards' help. Now, the Japanese government has pretty much come out and said that they are going to make the Battle of Leyte a decisive battle for this war, and for that reason, they are throwing all the resources and manpower they have to win this battle against America and not lose this island and up until this point they're doing a great job and then the 77th showed up they show up to Leyte Thanksgiving Day 1944 with the energy of dad didn't get to take his nap and now it's gonna be fucking everybody's problem okay oversimplified version of what's going on here the Americans have one half of the island the Japanese have the other the Americans are getting resupplied on their back end and the Japanese are getting resupplied on their back end from a place called Ormoc Bay so the 77th infantry is like that's fine hear me out we'll hop in the boats we'll drive around Leyte make an amphibious landing and we'll take over Ormoc Bay cut off their supplies game over we win to which the chain of command is like that's absolutely crazy you're going to be outnumbered three to one and we're not going to be able to get you any more supplies to which the 77th is like that's fine we'll just bring some supplies with us and then we'll steal all the enemy shit and as far as being outnumbered three to one we've been hanging out with the marines this entire time and if they've taught us anything that's just a target rich environment let's fucking run it so fast forward a couple of days december 7th the 77th id makes an amphibious landing in ormoc bay they catch the japanese completely off guard take over the entire thing get their entire division into the bay in 35 minutes then they start bringing in artillery and m10 tank destroyers so they get everything squared away they establish a defensive perimeter also known as a beachhead then first thing tomorrow bright and early they're gonna start kicking ass right right everything's great couple hours later guess who shows up a japanese landing ship full of japanese troops not having gotten the memo that America runs Ormoc Bay now. So the old bastards under the cover of night aim all of the artillery and the M10 tank destroyer at this ship as it gets closer and closer, getting ready to offload its barges full of troops and more supplies. The ship gets as close as it's gonna get, it sends out its first barge and the old bastards just wait patiently as the barge gets closer and closer. And as it gets within 50 feet of them, they open fire with the 50 caliber machine guns, pretty much sinking it immediately as the man on top of the M10 tank destroyer yells out, Get some flares in the air so I can hit these sons of bitches. As the flares get shot up, the enemy ship is illuminated as the artillery and the M10 open fire on it, sinking it in a matter of minutes. According to the 77th ID's unit historian, this is believed to be the only time in World War II history where an infantry unit has successfully sunk an enemy naval vessel. So they're already off to a great start, and what happens next is described by an observer from the War Department as a divisional epic. Over the course of the next eight weeks, the 77th goes on an absolute absolute rampage, taking over three cities and airfield and securing 43 miles of main supply chain roads, okay? It's not a big island. There's not that many roads. They've basically taken over all of them. And the entire time they're doing this, they are acquiring enemy supplies, everything from food to vehicles, and anything they don't use, they destroy. And they're not just out there stealing all the enemy shit. They're out there giving out death certificates like they're Oprah Winfrey giving out cars, because during this period, they are credited with 19,000 456 confirmed kills in return they suffered 543 americans killed in action that's a lot i'm not trying to diminish that in any way but it needs to be said that that is a 36 to 1 ratio okay 19,000 to 500 is an ass whooping and a half and this would be studied at fort benning by the advanced officers training program for the next 40 years on how to conduct a clinical textbook level ass whooping this two month long rampage would bring an end to the battle of leyte with america securing the island and the 77th would immediately be shipped over to begin preparations for the Battle of Okinawa. 
So they get to the staging area for the Battle of Okinawa, at which point they are informed that there is a small island chain known as the Karamaretto Islands. It is 15 miles off the coast of Okinawa, and the chain of command believes that they are going to be of strategic importance, and the 77th has to go clear them out. Now, the Karamaretto Islands is made up of four main islands, and the old bastards decide that they're going to take all four of them at once, because apparently they're in a hurry. So that's what they do. They launch an amphibious landing on all four islands at the exact same time. Some of the islands they take over with zero resistance whatsoever and the other islands, they face very, very little resistance. And for a second, it was so easy that they were kind of thinking maybe they just wasted a bunch of time and resources capturing these islands anyways. But upon further investigation, what they found was a fleet of 360 hastily made boats that were filled to the brim with explosives that the Japanese were going to use in a kamikaze style attack, but instead of planes, they were going to be driving explosive boats directly into American ships during the main invasion of Okinawa. So being able to prevent the enemy from using these weapons during the invasion of Okinawa made this entire mission completely worth it. Fast forward a couple of days, April 1st, 1945, Easter Sunday, the Battle of Okinawa begins. It is two Marine divisions and four Army divisions making the initial landing, and the 77th is not one of them. They are being held back in reserve. And just to be clear, they're not being held in reserve because the chain of command thinks that they're the second string backup guys. They're being held in reserve because they have the reputation of being the problem solvers, and they want to save the 77th until they diagnose where the real problem's at, and they're going to send the 77th in then. Pretty much immediately after the invasion of Okinawa, it becomes very clear to the chain of command that they missed a nearby airfield. There is a small island neighboring Okinawa known as Lishima, and on that island there is a Japanese airfield, and that airfield needs to go away. Problem is, that airfield is being guarded by 5,000 Japanese soldiers that are very well dug in, and they are not about to give up without a fight. So, they send in the 77th. The old bastards make quick work of it, securing the entire island of Lishima in six days, with none of the Japanese willing to surrender. Virtually all of them were killed in combat, approximately 5,000 enemy soldiers, with the 77th losing 258 men in return. And while the old bastards are securing Lishima, the Battle of Okinawa is still raging on. It is one of the bloodiest, most hard-fought battles in American history. The island is being guarded by over 100,000 Japanese soldiers, with hundreds of heavy artillery pieces, thousands of mortar positions, and fortified machine gun positions. They have the high ground and they have underground tunnel networks. This entire battle is a fucking meat grinder. The entire island of Okinawa is an enormous problem and nobody is having a good time, but one of the most problematic areas is a hundred foot high cliff face where the 96th Infantry Division has been absolutely shredded. This place is known as the Escarpment, or as it would later become known as Hacksaw Ridge. The old bastards are being sent in to do what the 96th Infantry Division couldn't pull off. As they show up, they send two battalions up the 100-foot-high cliff face to engage the enemy. The Japanese drove both battalions back, forcing all of them to retreat. All of them, except for one. One of the youngest old bastards, a 26-year-old medic by the name of Desmond Doss, who was unique in that he refused to carry a weapon into battle because he was a conscientious objector that didn't want to hurt anybody, he only wanted to save people. He stayed up top while everybody else retreated, and while evading the enemy, he managed to go around and find wounded Americans and begin lowering them down the cliff face all through the remainder of that day and all through the night. By the next morning, he had single-handedly lowered 75 men down a 100-foot cliff face, saving all of them. The next day, the 77th would attack again, this time sending up one battalion to engage the enemy and the other battalion out and around the side to flank them. During this battle, Desmond Doss would become mortally wounded by grenade shrapnel and sniper fire. While wounded, he continued to insist that the other medics and litter bearers continue to save other men rather than himself. The old bastards would finally take the ridge, killing over 3,500 Japanese soldiers and losing over 600 men of their own, but amongst them, was not Desmond Doss. The men of the 77th got Doss evacuated in time. He would survive and eventually go on to be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at Hacksaw Ridge. But as his journey in World War II came to an end, the old bastards still had work to do. Now the 77th is going to be sent to capture Shiri Castle, but in order to do that, they have to punch through the Shiri Line, which is essentially a natural wall of hills and cliffs, and on top of them is 50,000 Japanese soldiers manning fortified machine gun positions with overlapping fields of fire. At this point, almost all of the American forces are stopped in their tracks somewhere along this line. Two Marine divisions and another Army division, both stuck, unable to penetrate through. The spot where the 77th have to break through to get to Shiri Castle is approximately half a mile wide and two miles in length. It takes them 32 days of constant fighting 
to clear that two miles. During those 32 days and in that single plot of land, the Japanese forces suffered 14,000 men killed in action. All of the American divisions managed to break through the Shiri line around the same time, and the Battle of Okinawa would rage on for a little bit longer, but the Shiri line breaking was the last major defensive maneuver that the Japanese were able to do. Everything after that was small-scale skirmishes, and this would rapidly bring about an end to the Battle of Okinawa. After Okinawa had been secured, the 77th would receive word that they are to be shipped back to the Philippines where they are going to be retooled, refitted, and receive a bunch of new guys to replace the men that they had lost, and they are going to be the only combat unit that was present in the Battle of Okinawa that is also to partake in the first wave of the invasion of mainland Japan. Which is probably the shittiest compliment imaginable. Hey, you guys did such a great job that you get to do it again. Luckily, however, after arriving to the Philippine island of Cebu, the 77th ID would receive word that America had utilized a new type of weapon by dropping an atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, forcing the Japanese to surrender, and they would not have to go and invade the mainland of Japan. This is terrific news, but it left just one thing the 77th ID had to do before they could finally go back home. You see, all throughout the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and the rest of the Pacific, there were still Japanese military members all over the place, scattered pretty much everywhere. Many of these groups of Japanese soldiers would refuse to surrender for months, or in some cases, even years or decades, refusing to believe that the Japanese Empire would ever surrender. And in the case of Cebu, where the 77th currently were, up in the mountains, there were approximately 5,500 Japanese soldiers. Fortunately, they were willing to surrender because they got orders directly from the emperor. Unfortunately, they were willing to surrender to literally anybody except for the old bastards. Bear in mind, we're back in the Philippines. These Japanese soldiers hiding up in the mountains in Cebu are the remnants of what was left after the Battle of Leyte when the 77th went on a two-month-long rampage destroying everything. Now, to be fair, we don't know for sure why these guys were willing to surrender to literally anybody except for the old bastards. Maybe it was because they remembered a bunch of middle-aged men with a blue Statue of Liberty patch on their shoulder whooping their ass, and they just didn't want to surrender to them. Or, I, I have a... I have an alternative theory. You see, along this entire journey, the 77th has not only gained a reputation for being extremely effective in combat, but they've also gained a reputation for kind of, sort of, not really taking a whole lot of prisoners compared to everybody else. Now, bear in mind, this is the Imperial Japanese. Not many of these guys got taken as prisoner because they would rather die in combat than lose their honor by surrendering. Despite that, out of all the POWs that were taken, the 77th somehow managed to take on the least. You know what? Let me just read you guys the stats and you can come to your own conclusions. For all of the Pacific theater across all branches of the U.S. military, approximately 50,000 Japanese POWs were taken. That is a ratio of 44 to 1. For every four 45 enemy soldiers that the American forces came up against, 44 of them were killed in action, and one was taken prisoner. The 77th Infantry Division, on the other hand, only managed to take 358 POWs, which is a ratio of 122 to one. And it gets way worse if you want to talk about the Battle of Okinawa in particular. During the Battle of Okinawa, all of the U.S. forces combined took a total of 10,801 Japanese prisoners of war. That is a 10 to 1 ratio. Of those 10,801 POWs taken by the U.S. forces at the Battle of Okinawa, the 77th ID was responsible for 58 of them at a ratio of 278 to 1 compared to the U.S. Armed Forces ratio of 10 to 1. Okay, now to be completely honest, I have no idea why it's like that. Perhaps it's because the old bastards displayed exceptional rifle marksmanship. Maybe it's the fact that they took the jungle warfare lesson of if they don't stink, stick them to heart, and they followed through with that throughout the entire war. Either way, the fact of the matter is they've developed the reputation that they don't really take prisoners, and now there's 5,500 Japanese soldiers hiding up in the mountains that are too scared to surrender to the 77th ID and they need them to surrender so that they can finally go home and mow their lawn after like four years. You always start before everyone wakes up, including roosters. What the? Hey, shut up! You shut up! So the leadership of the 77th sends it up the chain of command. Hey, you're going to have to get some other unit out here to accept this surrender because they're willing to surrender to anybody except for us. To which the big army is like, just fuck it, figure it out. No, I'm not sending another group of guys out there. 
get them to surrender one way or the other, make it happen, chop chop, hurry up. Now the obvious answer is to just practice classic American diplomacy where you show up with a gun and a sandwich and ask them which one they would prefer and let them know that both is an option. The old bastards on the other hand have an even better idea. They are going to close this saga out the same way they opened it up by pulling some schoolyard bullshit and tomfoolery. So here's what they come up with. A lot of the new reinforcements that they were getting weren't old guys anymore. It was just whoever the army had. So it was 18, 19, 20 year old kids. So they took them, had them take the blue Statue of Liberty 77th ID patches off their uniform, and they're going to send them up the mountain, have the Japanese surrender to them, separate them from their guns right there, and march them down the mountain. So that's exactly what happens. They start marching the Japanese down the mountain. Japanese are happy because they've gotten to surrender to literally anybody except the old guys with the blue Statue of Liberty patch on their shoulder. And then they get to the bottom of the mountain where there's a bunch of old guys with the Statue of Liberty patch on their shoulder. So the Japanese promptly shit their pants thinking that they're all about to die, at which point the 77th is like, look, calm down. We don't, we don't care. We're not going to hurt you. I just need you guys to get on the boats so we can ship you off to wherever the army wants you so that we can then get on our boats and we can go home because we're sick of this shit. And that's what happens. That's it. The 77th goes back home. The unit gets deactivated and everybody lives happily ever after. So in conclusion, that is the story of the 77th Infantry Division, a.k.a the old bastards. A bunch of middle-aged men originally seen as nothing more than a bunch of guinea pigs whose only meaningful contribution to the war effort could be to collect data points and run experiments on that would somehow go on to become one of the most effective fighting forces the world had ever seen. They saw combat in the Pacific Theater for 11 months and during that time they would lose 2,100 men but for every old bastard that fell on the battlefield he would take with him 22 enemies. The 77th was credited with 43,651 confirmed kills during this time period. They were the busiest army division in the Pacific Theater, and they were the only army division that was declared to be Marines by the Marine Corps. For this, the members of the 77th were awarded six medals of honor, 19 distinguished service crosses, two distinguished service medals, 335 silver stars, 22 legions of merit, 25 soldier medals, 4,433 bronze stars and 16 distinguished unit citations. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Seriously, this is one of the best stories and one of the funnest things that I've ever got to research. That being said, for some reason, once I found out that pretty much all these guys were from the East Coast, the only thing I could picture in my head was that all 15,000 of these dudes were rich high. You know, angry cops here from YouTube. It's one of the most terrifying thoughts I've ever had in my entire life. Just 15,000 angry drill sergeants storming up the beach.